Thank you, David. We appreciate uh, that a lot. Um, I'm just here to facilitate you all asking questions and to ask questions when you don't ask questions. Okay, so I want a lot of participation. Um, I'll start with one and then we'll go to the audience. Um, oh, she's got one right there. Oh, go ahead. Okay, I'll start with one and then, and then we'll, we'll go to the audience. Um, so you were starting to do this right at the end. Um, tell us a little bit more about what's to come. So given these trends that you were highlighting, how should we as Christians think about the future and how will our, um, our roles as Christians in the world, as image bearers in the world change? Or how is that changing? I can tell you two areas. Of re I serve as the research director for the Commonwealth Project that you saw up there. And uh, the two areas we're researching now are gentrification. So where you have an inner city with very poor people that becomes desirable, and then wealthy people start moving in and rehabbing buildings and making apartments and things like that, which we would say is fundamentally good when a blighted area is restored voluntarily by people moving there but yet it prices poor people away from their jobs, away from their churches, away from the fabric of their community. It tears the fabric of the community that exists there. And so economists say that's universally good. The pastors I talk to in those places say it's universally bad. And so we wanna say biblically, what do we do with that? And so part of the, the uh, image in our research report on this is talking about um, sailing a ship on the ocean, okay? So that there are certain things that are regular, like the tides. You just know when they're coming and going, and we just need to educate Christians and churches and inner cities. These economic forces are flowing. The tide is coming in. You just can't battle that. But you can set your sail in a certain direction. You can trim the sail in a certain direction. And oh, by the way, storms come. And nobody expects those. And the church needs to be able to help people who are in those storms and are, are foundering and so forth. So that's one area we're working on. The other, which I think is, I don't know if it's more interesting, but is what do we do with jobs? Okay, we talked at dinner about what is money? We could have asked the question, what's a job? And lots of people think they know the answer to that. And lots of people think that jobs are like objects that are just out there that someone has or something like that. The job as we know it in a cubicle with health benefits and a regular paycheck, that's a new invention in history as we've been looking at that, that very few people had a regular paycheck in the history of mankind. And so we need to rethink that because uh, as I've said, 90% we're in, ag in agriculture. Today, it's under 2%. And I have just, just in April, I was talking to a farmer, and it just struck me. He said, well, of course, Dave, I buy my food at the grocery store. <laughs> and I guess I never really thought about that, that even the 2% of the workforce that are farming, he's like, there's no way I'm going to kill a cow and skin it for myself. That just takes too much work. Right? I sell cows for a living, and I buy my hamburger at Costco. <laughs> the same with the corn. He's like, I'm not going to harvest the corn and eat it. I have to grind it, make it into bread, tortillas. I buy tortillas at Costco. So anyway, those jobs have gone away and never are going to come back. So in 1948, more than half of the labor force was involved in manufacturing just after World War II. Now it's down to 11%. And I don't care what the president says, it's like economic ties. Those jobs are not coming back, okay? No one's gonna be working in factories. Robots works in factories now. Mm -hmm. What about truck drivers? Those jobs are going away faster than self-driving cars. What about artificial intelligence? Radiologists cannot detect, can't read a mammogram as fast as a computer today. So a very trained person is being replaced by artificial intelligence. Lawyers, you can go down. I really think Lord Maynard Keynes, a great economist, expected us to be working 15 hours a week by now and keeping our standard of living. And so I think that's going to, he was a little early in his prediction, but we're gonna be there. And so the church has to step in and say, not, hi, what's your name, what do you do? That's our expression that your, your occupation is a big part of your identity. It's like, who are you and what is, who are you serving? Are you serving your family? Are you serving people? Are you serving for money? How are you doing this? Because the concept of a job as we know it is not going to be around. Hmm. Um, I was thinking about the Bible verse 
verse where it says, store up your treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy and where things don't break in and steal. For where your treasure is there, that will be also. So in light of like how to store up your treasures in heaven or where to invest, like what does that look like in your opinion? That's a great question. Um, Could you actually, uh, for our going to ask, either oh. one of us should just go ahead. The question. Yeah, so what do we do about where we invest? earth what's the difference yeah so let's talk about stewardship and I think you can identify six categories of owning possessions okay for the accountants in the audience this is on the balance sheet and so there's certainly a category for subsistence well first of all let me back up and say the Bible endorses generosity all the time sacrificial generosity imitates Jesus Christ so you can always be more generous than what I'm describing but Zach's got kids at home and stuff like that. He, he serves God by teaching people here. Should he give everything he has away? Or, or conversely, what is okay for him to keep? And certainly subsistence. So Paul writes to Timothy saying that if you don't care for your own relative, for your own family, you're worse than an unbeliever. So I have milk in my refrigerator back in Denver. And I think that's okay, even though there's hungry people in Denver. Because that... I'll, I'll eat that, I'll use that milk when I get home. Okay, so that doesn't bother me, but that's a very low standard. Um, we also find utility, uh, so that you can keep the things you need for your job. So this, this podium provides utility for professors like that. You use this, this, this. So, so he shouldn't sell this. He doesn't have to sell it. He could sell it and give to the poor, but he could say, I'm gonna keep that so I can teach more effectively. Okay, so Paul, for example, talks about the hardworking fam farmer deserves uh, the first share of the crops, or nobody tends a vineyard without an expectation of the profit. Uh, don't muzzle an ox while it's trading out the grain. The, the underlying assumption of that is a farmer keeps his land, which is very valuable. Or a vineyard is actually a commercial operation. I love it. A wall around it, a press, that's a tower to guard the crop. That's, and by the way, vineyards are not subsistence. Vineyards are only for trading with other people. And so that's a commercial operation that Paul implicitly assumes is okay. So I have a car and I don't think I should, I have to sell, I could sell it and give, it to the, give the money to the poor, but I do keep a car so that I can get back and forth to work without walking and so forth. So, so we have subsistence, we have utility, um, then we have security, so he, he assumes that the Corinthians are going to be setting money aside on the first day of the week, or Ephesians 4.28, he says, let the thief steal no longer, but let him work with his hands, so he'll have something to share with those in need. Okay, so he assumes that you're going to make enough that you will have a surplus, that's called savings, right? You're not living hand to mouth, so that you could share with people in need in the future, or just as a security against the future, um, for example. We also have a category even of aesthetic enjoyment beyond utility. God gives us all things richly to enjoy. Nothing's to be rejected if it's received with thanksgiving. Okay, that's the dangerous category, okay? So I'm, I'm not saying these are all even. subsistence. If your kids are hungry, you probably shouldn't give that money away, I would say pastorally, okay? Utility, so you can work. Um, savings. Uh, also Paul says children shouldn't save for their parents, but parents should save for their children. Again, he's writing to the Corinthians on that. So there's an assumption that that's okay. Aesthetic enjoyment, but that's where I draw the line. Because there are categories of, of indulgence. So the, the self-indulgent widow is dead even while she lives. So that if you have possessions that you're keeping to your detriment, or to the detriment of other people, or that interferes with your ability to serve God, um, that is indulgence, and there's a line. And that's, that's the line of a wartime mentality, I would argue, here at Bethlehem. And then we have uh, signaling riches, okay? And so signaling riches, Paul says, women should dress modestly, not with gold and pearls and braided hair. And so I saw some braided hair around here. I was going to talk to you afterwards. But just to tell you, that's OK. Because in the Roman Empire, that would be, it's amazing. To have an elaborate braided hairstyle, and we have statuary of it, is basically saying, I have two slaves at home. 
right? One just to make soap and perfume in, one to do this work. It was just a, a display of wealth. Like, it's like a Ferrari or a Rolls Royce compared to a Ford Fusion. Both will get you to work, but braided hair in that Roman context was a Ferrari. So it, it, yeah. So anyway, that is signaling riches. And that's what I think we should be cautious against, guard against. If it matters who sees it, that's riches. If the label on your clothing is important, that's riches. Do you see the point? And so if it's only to signal about yourself, not for utility, not for your living, not as a store against the future, yeah, that's where Christians should draw the line. And by the way, if you want to talk about that more, uh, it's, this is really interesting that it's changed, right? I have 10 pairs of shoes. That's about half as much as most under, undergrads, but that's 10 times more than John the Baptist's friends, right? Remember, it's amazing. He said, and nobody laughed. Let him who has two tunics share with him who has none. And no one, I, I defy you to, tell, to name a person you, don't, who know, you know who has no clothes at all. And John the Baptist said, that's the rule to a society that made sense then. And so how do we deal with the fact that we have 10 pairs of shoes, black and brown, sneakers, I have a basketball pairs of shoes, I have some sandals for summer. It's not crazy signaling, but it is more than ever before. And so we need to be very careful. This is why, again, be transdisciplinary, study these things, because adultery hasn't changed. Mm -hmm. Stealing hasn't changed. But I will make the cautious assertion that what used to be greedy is no longer greedy. So I have a confession to make. Yeah. Do you remember the first Motorola cell phones? $3,900 for the Motorola cell phone. Gordon Gecko was talking on Wall Street. He was on the beach talking on a cell phone bigger than a brick. And I coveted in my heart, like how cool would that be to be able to talk on the beach, on a phone at sunset, stuff like that. Okay, that was signaling riches. That's why it was in Wall Street as the movie, as what's wrong, and it was wrong, I think. But now everybody, you know, who's an undergrad has this. It's changed. Adultery hasn't changed. Stealing hasn't changed. But the definition of the objects that constitute greed have, in fact, changed. Before we ask the next question, um, we've been meeting as a reading group over this last year um, and discussing issues like this. And um, we've encouraged students to taking these lenses and looking at our world. Um, one of the ways we do that is by educating ourselves. And so we've given all of these books to the students who have been part of the reading group. And so I have, uh, as a reward for being brave and asking the first question, a book for you. This book is uh, by Thomas Sowell called Basic Economics, A Common Sense Guide to the Economy. So I hope it helps you think more carefully about that lens. Other questions? Cool. Uh, so going back to the idea of working class, um, what do you think about the idea of the universal basic income? That is an area we are going to study. And it's very, this is, what, the yeah, oh yeah. So what about universal basic income? So economists are now proposing, okay, so we get rid of welfare, we get rid of Medicaid, we get rid of every government program, and we just mail everybody a check for $1,000 every month. And $12,000 a year is enough to eat and live and get by. So why don't we just guarantee that? And so this is something Christians exactly need to be studying and bringing, what are the biblical principles to bear here? So the economists say that actually you would save money by just mailing everybody a check because you don't have administrative costs, okay, of managing the program and seeing who's worthy or whatever. But they also would say if you blow your 12,000 this year, you just end up in the streets and starve. Okay, so you have to then, well, actually that's one. Other economists would say that it forces you to develop social networks. 
like this room, where someone in this room was just like, I have not eaten in two days, and I came here to this lecture. I mean, there's 10 people in this room would help that person. And so they want to force people to form networks like this church. Um, and there's some rationale to that, for example. Um, on the other hand, others will say that destroys the incentive to work. So you could just do nothing. Um, that's something that we need to study from a biblical perspective. I don't have a, a good answer. Um, so you talked about how job, jobs that exist today you know, didn't exist like 50 or 100 years ago, uh, just with the explosion of different specializations and types of work. And, um, so could you talk a little bit about like training? Because I think like that might be a, another thing where right. historically there was on the job training and there's there's been kind of some trends in like maybe expecting people to get that in, in other ways. Um, I mean but then like then you think about online like access to information through that is really like decreasing barriers to entry in other areas. Yeah, this is these are great questions. You guys, I'm so glad churches are doing exactly this because we need to be out in front because economists are filling the void in the discussion on the, the universal basic income, for example, or this one. This is where when someone was working uh, as a farmer and they got put out of business, the prices got so low, you could still get a job if you had a strong back on the railroad. And then when the railroads were largely built, you could get a job in a Ford plant, you know, and then you could work on the Eisenhower freeway. But now the truck driver, I mean, driving a truck, you would know this, you're a programmer, is a data management problem, right? You're, you're analyzing visual and other data, and computers can do that, I, I would argue, in five years, as well as a person. And we'll see semi-trucks with no drivers going around. But that poor driver, can't then go get a job as a data scientist or as a programmer or something like that. So how do we train people is a really good question. Um, I'll give a little bit of an answer to that in just a second. But this is the broader problem that it used to be there was more mobility in jobs. But now you have such a dichotomy between college educated people and not. And it's all the labor intensive jobs, the easy jobs that are going away. What do you do with those people? The very interesting book uh, about the European experiment in this, they said, we wanted workers and we got people. <laughs> so they wanted just labor to come in and so they allowed immigration, but then human beings with culture and beliefs and children came in. And so how we separate that is a challenge. So what I would say to this audience is that as Christians, we need to realize, and at Colorado Christian University, we have a, a, even for our engineering students, a liberal arts ed education of how do you think critically? How do you know history? How do you then, you know, so that you realize there won't be any permanent jobs, so that you just work with that. And then as Christians, we say, really what we're doing on the job is serving other people in love. Right? If you're only there for the paycheck, get a different job. That's not why we're there. We're serving other people in their needs. How do we, how do we put this together in the future so that you might only have two days of, in two days you could earn all the money you need you know, for the week, and then some, and then you have five days left. Who do you serve? Your family, yourself? What do you do? Um, economists were blindsided by Wikipedia. In other words, this enormous edifice of information, don't cite this on your papers, kids at home, but, but nonetheless, very amazing. Search, it's free, right? It's, it's too cheap to meter. And so science, economists didn't see that we'd have so many free things done voluntarily that are incredibly useful. It's just never happened before. Yeah, yeah How, uh, So in that kind of world where Technology may cause you to be zeroed out vocationally several times. How, kind of a general education, how, how important does lifelong learning become in that scenario? Amen. Yeah. yeah. Very. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. So, I mean, I got two degrees in my 20s, a degree, two degrees in my 30s, then a degree in my 40s. Yeah. And I think that will be typical. Which is great because, uh, I mean, that, I never, 
I never took out a loan, right? I was able to earn enough during the degrees or for the degrees to pay for it. And I think people will be productive enough to pay for their learning and take a year or two off of life to learn. That's very human. We're going away from the auto plant where every 57 seconds you repeat an operation eight hours a day. I would say an inhuman. I'm happy robots are destroying those jobs. I would say robots are not destroying those jobs fast enough so that the prices will go down so that people then can, can be more human? It's a great question. Mm -hmm. so, interesting, with your background, um, you put up the data on how we're flourishing. And much more articulate than my dad, he said, uh, don't anybody talk you into going back to the good old days. Mm -hmm. And you did a marvelous job of showing that. My, my question, though, is to see how we're flourishing, but yet to look at the world and see where we're not flourishing in our uh, dependence on God, our morality, our, it, it seems like it's haywire that there's a disconnect. Mm -hmm. And so what are you seeing as a theologian, as a, yeah. you know, how, how it's, everybody's doing really well and you have people coming from third world countries and saying, why do you even want to go to heaven? You're, you're already in heaven and you're living like you're there now. So right, right. what's going on here? And so it's a, I don't get it. Well, let me answer a Christian audience, but when I go to economic, the Association of Private Enterprise Economists, you know, just a room full of naturalistic, mostly atheistic economists, they just wallow around in a question like that. They're saying, why isn't, why aren't, they do all these studies on happiness. They're amazed that people aren't happy. It's what everybody always wanted, and you have it before you're 18. And then you're super unhappy, and so forth. The opioid, they study opioids, like why are people killing themselves to try to be happy? They just don't have an answer. I mean, ultimately, you know, sin is the problem, right? The futility, Romans 8, introduced because of the curse into creation, causes the scarcity that economists are studying. And so the gospel is the answer through the local church, the answer. And so, but what I hope to move the needle through the uh, Institute for Faith, Work, and Economics at Colorado Christian University, even here tonight, is for us to have a lens to realize it's a great life that, you know, compared that you just, it is great. Um, I love talking to kids when I'm getting on an airplane. You know, I just eight years old, it's like, are you gonna be traveling 500 miles an hour here in about 10 minutes? <clears throat> Something, that's a lot of, that's just, you know, and uh, you're gonna be five miles in the sky? You know, I was in Athens this last summer. Do you know what they call people who sit on chairs in the sky in Greece? They call them gods. <laughs> and then you tell that to an eight-year-old, it's, it's a lens that he sees his world completely differently. And it fills you with gratitude and joy to, to see that happening. And so I, th I think there's room for us to study these secondary fields. Not just practically, though Dave Ramsey will help you do it, not just philosophically, as we've looked at here in interpretive data, but doxologically. God is not being worshipped enough because not enough people see the world this way. I just went back to you talking about um, the work we possibly going down to something like 15 hours and the rest being free, pretty much. And just remembering uh, Genesis 128 that you referenced as well. Um, God gave work as part of man's commission, and it wasn't until after the curse that it got hard. Um, so just wondering how that ties, because when I, I mean, when I see, or see talks about people not having work or not having enough to do and basically not being fulfilled or happy, um, that's actually what helps cause so many problems. So how would a 15-hour work week actually be good for people? Oh, human that's what we need to. That's what we need to address. Because no, you should six days. You should labor, yeah. right? And one day rest. I think that principle doesn't go away. And so, praise God. By labor, I mean maybe sitting in a keyboard and thinking and serving and making phone calls versus, you know, field backbreaking labor. But the key is we need biblically to tell people that work is not instrumental. Work is intrinsic. It's not instrumentally valuable, it's intrinsically valuable as a human being. So the person who says, if I win the lottery, I'll not come back to this job, 
is only viewing his work as instrumental to get a paycheck. I'm only here because I need the money. But it, you're, you're exactly right. We're there to work because God created us to work. We are to subdue creation as co-creators with God. And so what that looks like when I don't have to work as the average person has never been explored before in the history of mankind. So Aristotle would say, perfect, let's all sit around and be contemplative philosophers. This is exactly what we should do. We can be ourselves now. And I, I agree with you, that's not what it's going to look like. I suppose part of it, uh, the words that we use, because we so often associate work with a paycheck, but maybe if we think of it more as being productive. If, if, if you'll allow me to wordsmith it, I would say the paycheck is the signal, not the goal. Okay, the paycheck is the signal that you have served those people and they are pleased with what you have done. Okay, it's not the goal of working. And so that's where if no one will pay me to do something, I, I wouldn't do it. I just don't think they would value it. So, yeah. I'll start this thing back there. Yeah. I just want to mention that I think there's a very important economic concept um, coming about. It has to do with the cashless society, which they basically have in Sweden, but um, there's also um, uh, a kind of uh, non-currency uh, currency, Bitcoin, that is, uh, there's another name for it. But now they're talking about the federal government creating a, a Fed coin kind of currency and doing away with the dollar. They're already talking about um, doing away with $100 bills and $50 bills because that's what terrorists and, and uh, drug uh, people and whatever use. Um, but where, where it hinges, I think, is the possibility through blockchain, blockchain technology, for the government to know where every dollar is, how, how much you have in your, all of your bank accounts, how much you have uh, traveling around. And um, I think of this in conjunction with, I don't see how they can pay off $20 trillion of acknowledged debt plus $105 trillion of um, imputed debt of this country. That's this country alone. And I think, I, think we're, I think we're going fast down the path to some kind of alternative currency which the Federal Reserve controls. So there's an economic concept for you all. I'll be dead before. <laughs> Yeah. Currency is whatever people decide to trade that will serve as a unit of exchange, a store of value, and a unit of account. And so Facebook likes, Snapchat followers. Apple Pay. Is, no, I'm just saying, uh, social media is a currency that people work for. And so, yeah, they will never lack for currency because people create it to, to trade. The only question is, how much does the currency cost? It's kind of a weird way to think about it, but a friend of mine bought a, a condo in Russia, and in Moscow, and it's been a few years back, but he had to pay in cash in US $100 bills. So he had to hire two, I guess you'd call them goons, to carry from Finland his $120,000 cash, and he had to pay them 4% of the transaction cost in order to pay for his condo. And so that's just a very expensive money, right? It's not the value of money, it's the, the function of money was expensive. A debit card is just a lot cheaper. But I'm so. not just talking about the function of money, I'm talking about the potential for control of human beings yeah. through the currency. I mean, yeah, the next persecution of Christians will be very brief because everybody knows where I am and how I spend my money and it's impossible to hide who you are. And so, I mean, we put our trust in God alone in this. And the church has been persecuted before. Never before have the tools of persecution been better than what we or our children, our children's children will face. But yeah, this, that's not an economic problem, that's a sin problem. So, 
You had a question, then. Yeah, the workplace has a big emphasis on numbers, right? So labor hours, sales, etc. Um, and you know, part of my job is to make sure that is is going well. So how do you balance the all important numbers that come with business, that come with the workplace, with the people that are being served, people that need to be served, and whatever resources you're providing? Yeah, that's a great question. The reason I put the words honest profit in yellow, and I never show the word profit by itself. Because I do say there's a moral category there. It is a signal as long as you haven't sinned against the person, you haven't defrauded the person, as long as your family hasn't been neglected, as long as your church hasn't been neglected, all these other aspects of your life are in order. And the people pay you more than it costs to make something. That's an honest profit. And so you're exactly right. That, I mean, you could enslave your employees and not pay them, <laughs> and your numbers would go up. But that violates you know, the Bible in a clear way. The, the real challenge is the wisdom to be able to coordinate human beings as human beings, mm -hmm. right? In order to then serve other human beings in a way that generates a profit. And if you don't, that's just a signal that either other people are doing it better than you and you need to think of a different way. At Ford, we'd say, let's add brains. We'd never go out and sh shout at people and tell them to work faster or make them work longer. We're like, how do we add brains to this process so we have less scrap, less waste, nobody's standing around because they're waiting for something. How do we add brains and make our numbers that way? That's actually the more Christian way, and it's, it's harder. But we pray for wisdom. I'm going to interject a question here. Um, so a lot of the graphs are going up, and the assumption there is all better, right? Um, and I hope I nuanced that. Yeah, no, yeah, I think you did. Um, so let me ask one as it relates to taking dominion of the earth. Um, is there a difference between taking dominion and dominating the earth in a bad way? Um, and is, are there more dangers of doing that given the sort of technology and ways of harnessing resources that we have now? If there are dangers in that, what are they and how can we avoid yeah. I mean, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above displays his handiwork. And so Mike Bulmore wrote a great article. You guys study here at uh, Bethlehem Baptist. I saw it in Andy Nicelli's syllabus this afternoon. So yeah, creation itself displays the glory of God. So I'm not saying we should pave everything, right? Just mm -hmm. asphalt it all, get the buildings till, till there's no trees left. Um, it's, I will just, to make this short, say that under communism, in totalitarian places, you have the worst pollution in the world. And in free markets, uh, one of the first things people, when they had a little bit of surplus around the time of the Reformation in Geneva, they bought sanitation. <laughs> like they, they, the first thing they did was fix the sewage from running in the streets. And instead of having infant mortality at four out of 10 before the age of five, it went down to two out of 10, which is still a, a screaming tragedy by our standards. But that is what caused that exponential to start, was people cleaning up their environments. And so people, when they have the money, will will choose to, or what, I mean, the data says they have chosen, yeah, we, we like the environment. Um, in Brazil, they slash up the rainforest because their kids are hungry. And you just know the moms in this room, you would slash up a rainforest too if your kids were hungry. You know, right? And so I don't blame the moms. It's uh, how do we get an economic policy down there where they can earn money in a better way than destroying the environment. Time to move. Two more questions. Um, in reference to a previous question, um, I just reminded that like Charles Darwin, you know, he all about science, and he became a clergyman just because they didn't really have to do much work and they had all this <laughs> free time. Uh, so just on the like, people do you know they do what they love to do mm -hmm. when they have free time, and so they're interested in that universal wage. On a different topic, um, I'm interested if you interacted with Wendell Berry at all and what you think of all you know us moving into these higher fields of data science and how that relates to um, some just very like natural what it means to be human and engage with God's creation yeah I think Wendell Berry is dangerous <coughs> I went to his hometown and 
if we adopted what Wendell Berry recommends, billions of people would starve to death. And so I also, when people who are, this get controversial here, so at the end, it's like organic farming. The, it's great if you're rich, but organic farming is not going to feed 7 billion people. And so, yeah, are there trade-offs as we have this many people on the planet? Yes. Um, are there way, yeah. So I could argue that I like FaceTime. Wendell Berry wouldn't like FaceTime, but I'll be in the Middle East this summer. I can stay in touch with my family via FaceTime. Um, so all that to say is I, well, he's not exactly biblical. I get where he's coming from. He's close to being biblical, but we need to rethink because these things, these seven billion people aren't going away. And um, we just cannot go back to everybody having their little plots. Yeah, who wants their plot anyway? I mean, if you want a plot, go to Kentucky. Their plot's for sale. You can be a <laughs> subsistence farmer if you want. No one's stopping you. I just don't find droves of people doing it. So, does that answer your question? We can talk more about Wendell Berry. He's an interesting, interesting fellow. But I went exactly to Carolyn, Kentucky to see that, I mean, those are real stores and real barns that he's describing there. So it's, it's charming. Just, I don't want people to die. Yes, sir. <laughs> There's two more here in the air. And I can't remember if you said you were going to address this, or I just hoped you were going to address it, but um, in terms of jobs for the poor, yeah. you know, were you going to say more about that? Or, I mean, just with, the, with all the changes that you're talking about, and what in, what's being thought about there? Yeah, jobs for the poor. Do you mean low-skilled? Yeah, or just... Yeah, I mean, okay. there's, there's all the people that are losing their jobs right. because of the technology and the robots. And right, so like the people who made buggy whips and black and white TV, these people on the street. It's, it's tough because the rate of job generation has always been faster than, there's always been replacements. I mean, unemployment is 4.4%. I mean, as of we sit here tonight, that's... that's Not really, but okay. <laughs> It's pretty good. I mean, it's, it's, it's not terrible. Um, so, I mean, there are things that are happening. My concern is the whole classes of occupations are going to be made outmoded and that it's going to be difficult for people who used to drive a truck to do whatever replaces that. Now, um, as a Christian, I read Revelation, and I am optimistic, right? Jesus Christ wins, and God is glorified, and is all in all. As an economist, I'm also optimistic, because in 1970, uh, the Fortune Top 100, 71 of the companies made a product you could touch. A car, General Electric engines, stuff like that. Now it's only 30. And so 70% of the companies in the Fortune Top 100 are service providers, AT&T, cellular service, Google search. You know, their services have dominated and filled in and nobody expected that. I'm optimistic as an economist, but I do think the church has a job to do in two ways. Helping the displaced truck driver to feed his family and to get retrained. That's not a government job, that's a family of God job, I think. And number two, teach undergraduates, teach high school students. You cannot drop out of high school. You can't just slide through college. You've got to learn how to learn. And like I said, I was an engineer before I was a financial controller of a plant, before I was an economics teacher, before I was a pastor, before I was dean of theology. You just got to learn how to learn and follow God's calling, sometimes through economic signals. So. We, can, we have the work to do as a church. And you guys are doing great. I'm so glad you are here thinking about these things. And I hope you are intrigued to go on to Thomas Sowell's book is excellent. If you want to listen to Freakonomics, it's a podcast. Planet Money is a great podcast, very accessible, comes out twice a week. Econ Talk is from um, uh, the Library of Economics and Liter Liter Liberty. It's an hour a week, very accessible. You can read and learn these things without going to get your master's degree, and you will never regret 
20 years from now that you knew more about finance and, and economics than, than if you had not done that. So thanks. And also, if, if he'll let me, I'm going to stay around. So if you have other questions, I'll, I'll be happy to talk to you individually when we're done. Excellent. Thank you so much for coming. Um, please come up and ask David a questions. But before you do, please join me in thanking him for the evening.